Section 11 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3. Translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Story of Abu Hassan, or The Sleeper Awakened, Part 1. In the reign of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, there lived at Baghdad a very rich merchant, who, having married a woman advanced in years, had but one son, whom he named Abu Hassan, and educated with great restraint. When his son was thirty years old, the merchant, dying, left him his sole heir, and master of great riches, amassed together with much frugality and close application to business. Abu Hassan, whose views and inclinations were very different from those of his father, determined to make another use of his wealth, for as his father had never allowed him any money but what was just necessary for subsistence, and he had always envied those young persons of his age who wanted for nothing, and who debarred themselves from none of those pleasures to which youth are so much addicted, he resolved in his turn to distinguish himself by extravagances proportionable to his fortune. To this end he divided his riches into two parts. With one half he bought houses in town and land in the country, with a resolution never to touch the income of his real estate, which was considerable enough to live upon very handsomely, but lay it all by as he received it. With the other half, which consisted of ready money, he designed to make himself amends for the time he had lost by the severe restraint in which his father had always kept him. With this intent, Abu Hassan formed a society with youths of his own age and condition, who thought of nothing but how to make their time pass agreeably. Every day he gave them splendid entertainments, at which the most delicate viands were served up, and the most exquisite wines flowed in profusion while concerts of the best vocal and instrumental music by performers of both sexes heightened their pleasures, and this young band of debauchees, with the glasses in their hands, joined their songs with this music. These feasts were accompanied by ballets, of which the best dancers of both sexes were engaged. These entertainments, renewed every day, were so expensive to Abba Hassan that he could not support the extravagance above a year, and the great sum which he had appropriated to this prodigality and the year ended together. As soon as he had discontinued keeping this table, his friends forsook him. Whenever they saw him, they avoided him, and if by chance he met any of them and went to stop them, they always excused themselves on some pretense or other. Abu Hassan was more affected by this behaviour of his friends, who had forsaken him so basely and ungratefully, after all the protestations they had made him of inviolable attachment, than by the loss of all the money he had so foolishly squandered. He went melancholy and thoughtful, his countenance expressive of deep vexation, into his mother's apartment, and sat down on the end of a sofa at a distance from her. "'What is the matter with you, son?' said his mother, seeing him thus depressed. "'Why are you so altered, so dejected, and so different from yourself? "'You could not certainly be more concerned if you had lost all you had. "'I know you have lived very extravagantly, and believe all your money is spent. "'You have still, however, a good estate, "'and the reason that I did not so much oppose your irregular way of living was that I knew the wise precaution you had taken to preserve half your property. I do not, therefore, see why you should plunge yourself into this deep melancholy. At these words, Abu Hassan melted into tears, and in the midst of his sighs, he exclaimed, Ah, mother, I see at last how insupportable poverty must be. I am sensible that it deprives us of joy, as the setting of the sun does of light as poverty makes us forget all the commendations passed upon us before our fall, it makes us endeavour to conceal ourselves, and spend our nights in tears and sorrow. In short, a poor man is looked upon, both by friends and relations, as a stranger. 
You know, mother, how I have treated my friends for this year past. I have entertained them with all imaginable generosity, till they have spent all my money, and now they have left me, when they suppose I can treat them no longer. For my real estate, I thank heaven for having given me grace to keep the oath I made not to encroach upon that. I shall now know how to use what is left. But I will, however, try how far my friends, who deserve not that I should call them so, will carry their ingratitude. I will go to them, one after another, and when I have represented to them what I have done on their account, ask them to make up a sum of money to relieve me, merely to try if I can find any sentiment of gratitude remaining in them. I do not pretend, son, said Abu Hassan's mother, to dissuade you from your design, but I can tell you beforehand that you have no ground for hope. Believe me, you will find no relief but from the estate you have reserved. I see you do not, but will soon know these people, who, among persons of your sort, are generally called friends, and I wish to heaven you may know it in the manner I desire, for your own good. Mother, replied Abu Hassan, I am persuaded of the truth of what you say, but shall be more certain of a fact which concerns me so nearly, when I shall have informed myself fully of their baseness and insensibility. Abu Hassan went immediately to his friends, whom he found at home, represented to them the great need he was in, and begged of them to assist him. He promised to give bonds to pay them the money they might lend him, giving them to understand at the same time that it was in a great measure on their account that he was so distressed. That he might the more powerfully excite their generosity, he forgot not to allure them with the hopes of being once again entertained in the same manner as before. Not one of his companions was affected with the arguments which the afflicted Abba Hassan used to persuade them, and he had the mortification to find that many of them told him plainly they did not know him. He returned home, full of indignation, and going into his mother's apartment, said, Ah, madam, you were right. Instead of friends, I have found none but perfidious ungrateful wretches, who deserve not my friendship. I renounce them, and promise you, I will never see them more. He resolved to be as good as his word, and took every precaution to avoid falling again into the inconvenience which his former prodigality had occasioned, taking an oath never to give an inhabitant of Baghdad any entertainment while he lived. He drew the strong-box into which he had put the rents received from his estates, from the recess where he had placed it in reserve, put it in the room of that he had emptied, and resolved to take out every day no more than was sufficient to defray the expenses of a single person to sup with him, who, according to the oath he had taken, was not of Baghdad, but a stranger arrived in the city the same day, and who must take his leave of him the following morning. Conformably to this plan, Abu Hassan took care every morning to provide whatever was necessary, and towards the close of the evening went and sat at the end of Baghdad Bridge, and as soon as he saw a stranger, accosted him civilly, invited him to sup and lodge with him that night, and after having informed him of the law he had imposed upon himself, conducted him to his house. The repast with which Abu Hassan regaled his guests was not costly, but well dressed, with plenty of good wine, and generally lasted till the night was pretty far advanced. Instead of entertaining his guests with the affairs of state, his family, or business, as is too frequent, he conversed on different agreeable subjects. He was naturally of so gay and pleasant a temper that he could give the most agreeable turns to every subject, and make the most melancholy persons merry. When he sent away his guest the following morning, he always said, God preserve you from all sorrow wherever you go. When I invited you yesterday to come and sup with me, I informed you of the law I have imposed on myself. Therefore do not take it ill if I tell you that we must never see one another again, nor drink together, 
either at home or anywhere else, for reasons best known to myself. So God conduct you. Abu Hassan was very exact in the observance of this oath, and never looked upon or spoke to the strangers he had once entertained. If he met them afterwards in the streets, the squares, or any public assemblies, he affected not to see them, and turned away to avoid them, that they might not speak to him, or he have any communication with them. He had acted for a long time in this manner, when, one afternoon, a little before sunset, as he sat upon the bridge according to custom, the caliph Harun al-Rashid came by, but so disguised that it was impossible to know him. For that monarch, though his chief ministers and officers of justice acquitted themselves of their duty very punctually, would nevertheless inform himself of everything, and for that purpose often disguised himself in different ways, and walked through the city and suburbs of Baghdad, sometimes one way and sometimes another, that day, being the first of the month, he was dressed like a merchant of Mosul, and was followed by a tall, stout slave. As the caliph had in his disguise a grave and respectable appearance, Abu Hassan, who thought him to be a Mosul merchant, rose up, and after having saluted him with a graceful air, said to him, Sir, I congratulate you on your happy arrival in Baghdad. I beg you to do me the honour to sup with me and repose yourself at my house for this night, after the fatigue of your journey. He then told him his custom of entertaining the first stranger he met with. The caliph found something so odd and singular in Abu Hassan's whim, that he was very desirous to know the cause, and told him that he could not better merit a civility, which he did not expect as a stranger, than by accepting the obliging offer made him, that he had only to lead the way, and he was ready to follow him. Abu Hassan treated the caliph as his equal, conducted him home, and led him into a room very neatly furnished, where he set him on a sofa in the most honourable place. Supper was ready, and the cloth laid. Abu Hassan's mother, who took upon herself the care of the kitchen, sent up three dishes. The first contained a capon and four large poulets, which was set in the middle, and the second and third, placed on each side, contained one a fat roasted goose, and the other broiled pigeons. This was all, but they were good of the kind, and well flavoured, with proper sauces. Abu Hassan sat down opposite his guest, and he and the caliph began to eat heartily of what they liked best, without speaking or drinking, according to the custom of the country. When they had done eating, the caliph's slave brought them water to wash their hands, and in the meantime Abu Hassan's mother cleared the table, and brought up a dessert of all the various sorts of fruits then in season, as grapes, peaches, apples, pears, and various pastes of dried almonds, and so on. As soon as it grew dark, wax candles were lighted, and Abu Hassan, after requesting his mother to take care of the caliph's slave, set out bottles and glasses. Abu Hassan, sitting down with the pretended Mosul merchant again, filled out a glass of wine before he touched the fruit, and holding it in his hand, said to the caliph, You know, sir, that the cock never drinks before he calls to his hens to come and drink with him. I invite you to follow my example. I do not know what you may think, but for my part, I cannot reckon him a wise man who does not love wine. Let us leave that sort of people to their dull, melancholy humours, and seek for mirth, which is only to be found in a bumper. While Abu Hassan was drinking, the caliph, taking the glass that was set for him, said, You are an honest fellow. I like your pleasant temper, and expect you will fill me as much. Abu Hassan, as soon as he had drunk, filled the caliph's glass, and giving it to him, Taste this wine, sir said he, I will warrant it good. I am well persuaded of that, replied the caliph, laughing. You know how to choose the best. Oh, replied Abu Hassan, while the caliph was drinking his glass, one need only look in your face to be assured that you have seen the world, and know what good living is. If, added he, in Arabic verse, 
my house could think and express its joy, how happy would it be to possess you, and bowing before you would exclaim, how overjoyed am I to see myself honoured with the company of so accomplished and polite a personage, and for meeting with a man of your merit. The caliph, naturally fond of merriment, was highly diverted with these sallies of Abu Hassan, and artfully promoted drinking, often asking for wine, thinking that when it began to operate, he might from his talkativeness satisfy his curiosity. He asked him his name, his business, and how he spent his life. "'My name, sir,' replied he, "'is Abu Hassan. I lost my father, who was a merchant of Baghdad, and though not the richest, yet lived very comfortably. When he died, he left me money enough to live free from business. But, as he always kept a very strict hand over me, I was willing, when he was gone, to make up for the time I thought I had lost. Notwithstanding this, continued Abu Hassan, I was more prudent than most young people who give themselves up to debauchery, without any thought, pursue it till they reduce themselves to the utmost poverty, and are forced to do penance during the rest of their lives. To avoid this misfortune, I divided what I had left me into two parts, landed estate and ready money. I destined the ready money to supply the expenses of entertaining my acquaintance. I meditated, and took a fixed resolution not to touch my rents. I associated with young people of my own age, and with my ready money, which I spent profusely, treated them splendidly every day, and in short, spared for no sort of pleasure. But this course did not last long, for by the time the year was out, I had got to the bottom of my box, and then all my table friends vanished. I made a visit to every one of them successively, and represented to them the miserable condition I was in, but none of them offered to relieve me. Upon this I renounced their friendship, and retrenched so far as to live within the compass of my income, bound myself to keep company with none but the first stranger I might meet with, coming every day into Baghdad, and to entertain him but one day and one night. I have told you the rest before, and I thank my good fortune this day for having met with a stranger of so much worth. The caliph was well satisfied with this information, and said to Abu Hassan, I cannot enough commend the measures you have taken, and the prudence with which you have acted, by forsaking your debauchery, a conduct rarely to be met with in young persons, and I esteem you the more for being steady to your resolution. It was a slippery path you trod in, and I cannot but admire your self-command that, after having seen the end of your ready money, you could so far refrain as not to enter upon your rents, or even your estate. In short, I must own, I envy your situation. You are the happiest man in the world, to enjoy every day the company of someone with whom you can discourse freely and agreeably, and to whom you give an opportunity to declare, wherever he goes, how handsome he was received by you. But we talk too long without drinking. Come, drink, and pour out a glass for me. In this manner the caliph and Abu Hassan conversed together, drinking and talking of indifferent subjects, till the night was pretty far advanced, when the caliph, pretending to be fatigued after his journey, told his host he stood in need of a little rest. But, added he, as I would not deprive you of yours on my account, before we part, because to-morrow I may be gone before you are stirring, I should be glad to show you how sensible I am of your civility, and the good cheer and hospitality you have shown me. The only thing that troubles me is that I know not which way to make you any acknowledgment. I beg of you, therefore, to let me understand how I may do it, and you shall see I will not be ungrateful, for it is impossible but a man like you must have some business, some want, or wish for something agreeable to you. Speak freely, and open your mind, for though I am but a merchant, it may be in my power to oblige you myself, or by some friend. To these offers of the caliph, Abu Hassan, taking him still for a Mosul merchant, replied, I am very well persuaded, sir, that it is not out of compliment that you make me these generous tenders, 
but upon the word of an honest man. I assure you I have nothing that troubles me, no business, nor desires, and I ask nothing of anybody. I have not the least ambition, as I told you before, and am satisfied with my condition. Therefore, I can only thank you for your obliging proffers, and the honour you have done me in condescending to partake of my frugal fare. Yet I must tell you, pursued Abu Hassan, there is one thing gives me uneasiness, without, however, disturbing my rest. You must know the town of Baghdad is divided into quarters, in each of which there is a mosque with an imam to perform service at certain hours, at the head of the quarter which assembles there. The imam of the division I live in is a surly curmudgeon, of an austere countenance, and the greatest hypocrite in the world. Four old men of this neighbourhood, who are people of the same stamp, meet regularly every day at this imam's house. There they vent their slander, calumny, and malice against me and the whole quarter, to the disturbance of the peace of the neighbourhood, and the promotion of dissension. Some they threaten, others they frighten, and in short would be lords paramount, and have every one govern himself according to their caprice, though they know not how to govern themselves. Indeed, I am sorry to see that they meddle with anything but their Koran, and will not let the world live quietly. Well, I suppose, said the caliph, you wish to have a stop put to this disorder. You have guessed right, answered Abu Hassan, and the only thing I should pray for would be to be caliph, but for one day, in the stead of our sovereign lord and master Harun al-Rashid, commander of the faithful. What would you do if you were? asked the caliph. I would make examples of them, answered Abu Hassan, to the satisfaction of all honest men. I would punish the four old men with each a hundred bastinados on the soles of their feet, and the imam with four hundred, to teach them not to disturb and abuse their neighbours in future. The caliph was extremely pleased with this thought of Abu Hassan's, and as he loved adventures, resolved to make this a very singular one. Indeed, said he, I approve much of your wish, which proceeds from an upright heart, that cannot bear the malice of such officious hypocrites. I could like to see it realised, and it is not so impossible as you may imagine. I am persuaded that the caliph would willingly put his authority for twenty-four hours into your hands, if he knew your intentions, and the good use you would make of it. Though a foreign merchant, I have credit enough to contribute in some degree to the execution of this plan. I see, said Abu Hassan, you laugh at my foolish fancy, and the caliph himself would laugh at my extravagance if he knew it. Yet it would be a means of informing him of the behaviour of the imam and his companions, and induce him to chastise them. Heaven forbid, replied the caliph, that I, who have been so handsomely entertained by you, should laugh at you. Neither do I believe, as much a stranger as I am to you, that the caliph would be displeased. But let us leave off talking. It is almost midnight, and time to go to bed. With all my heart, said Abu Hassan, I would not be any hindrance to your going to rest. But there is still some wine in the bottle, and if you please... We will drink it off first, and then retire. The only thing that I have to recommend to you is, that when you go out in the morning, if I am not up, you will not leave the door open, but give yourself the trouble of shutting it after you. This the caliph promised to do, and, while Abu Hassan was talking, took the bottle and two glasses, filled his own first, saying, Here is a cup of thanks to you and then filling the other, put into it artfully a little opiate powder, which he had about him, and giving it to Abu Hassan, said, You have taken the pains to fill for me all night, and it is the least I can do to save you the trouble once. I beg you to take this glass. Drink it off for my sake. Abu Hassan took the glass, and to show his guest with how much pleasure he received the honour, drank it off at once 
but had scarcely set the glass upon the table when the powder began to operate. He fell into so sound a sleep, and his head knocked against his knees so suddenly, that the caliph could not help laughing. The caliph commanded the slave he had brought with him, who entered the room as soon as he had supped, and had waited to receive orders, to take Abu Hassan upon his back and follow him, but to be sure to observe the house, that he might know it again. In this manner the caliph, followed by the slave with his sleeping load, went out of the house, but without shutting the door after him, as he had been desired, went directly to his palace, and, by a private door into his own apartment, where the officers of his chamber were in waiting, whom he ordered to undress Abu Hassan, and put him into his bed, which they immediately performed. The caliph then sent for all the officers and ladies of the palace, and said to them, I would have all those whose business it is to attend my levy wait to-morrow morning upon the man who lies in my bed, pay the same respect to him as to myself, and obey him in whatever he may command. Let him be refused nothing that he asks, and be addressed and answered as if he were the commander of the faithful. In short, I expect that you attend to him as the true caliph, without regarding me, and disobey him not in the least circumstance. The officers and ladies, who understood that the caliph meant to divert himself, answered by low bows, and then withdrew, every one preparing to contribute to the best of their power to perform their respective parts adroitly. The caliph next sent for the grand vizier. Jaffier, said he, I have sent for you to instruct you, and to prevent your being surprised to-morrow when you come to audience, at seeing this man seated on my throne in the royal robes. Accost him with the same reverence and respect as you pay to myself. Observe and punctually execute whatever he bids you do, the same as if I commanded you. He will exercise great liberality, and commission you with the distribution of it. Do all he commands, even if his liberality should extend so far as to empty all the coffers in my treasury. And remember to acquaint all my emirs and the officers without the palace, to pay him the same honour at audience as to myself, and to carry on the matter so well that he may not perceive the least thing that may interrupt the diversion which I design myself. After the Grand Vizier had retired, the Caliph went to bed in another apartment, and gave Mesrur, the chief of his eunuchs, the orders which he was to execute, that everything should succeed as he intended, so that he might see how Abu Hassan would use the power and authority of the Caliph for the short time he had desired to have it. Above all, he charged him not to fail to awaken him at the usual hour, before he awakened Abu Hassan because he wished to be present when he arose. Misrur failed not to do as the caliph had commanded, and as soon as the caliph went into the room where Abu Hassan lay, he placed himself in a little raised closet, from whence he could see all that passed. All the officers and ladies who were to attend Abu Hassan's levy went in at the same time, and took their posts according to their rank, ready to acquit themselves of their respective duties, as if the caliph himself had been going to rise. As it was just daybreak, and time to prepare for the morning prayer before sunrise, the officer who stood nearest to the head of the bed put a sponge steeped in vinegar to Abu Hassan's nose, who immediately turning his head about, without opening his eyes, discharged a kind of phlegm, which was received in a little golden basin before it fell on the carpet. This was the usual effect of the caliph's powder, the sleep lasting longer or shorter in proportion to the dose. When Abu Hassan laid down his head on the bolster, he opened his eyes, and by the dawning light that appeared, found himself in a large room, magnificently furnished, the ceiling of which was finely painted in arabesque, adorned with vases of gold and silver, and the floor covered with a rich silk tapestry. He saw himself surrounded by many young and handsome ladies, many of them having instruments of music in their hands, 
and black eunuchs, richly clothed, all standing with great modesty and respect. After casting his eyes on the covering of the bed, he perceived it was cloth of gold, richly embossed with pearl and diamonds, and near the bed lay on a cushion a habit of tissue embroidered with jewels with a caliph's turban. At the sight of these glittering objects, Abu Hassan was in the most inexpressible amazement, and looked upon all he saw as a dream, yet a dream he wished it not to be. So, said he to himself, I am caliph. But, added he, recollecting himself, it is only a dream, the effect of the wish I entertained my guest with last night. And then he turned himself about and shut his eyes to sleep. At the same time, the eunuch said very respectfully, Commander of the Faithful, it is time for your majesty to rise to prayers. The morning begins to advance. These words very much surprised Abu Hassan. Am I awake, or do I sleep? said he to himself. Ah, oh, certainly I am asleep, continued he, keeping his eyes shut. There is no reason to doubt of it. Immediately the eunuch, who saw he had no inclination to get up, said again, Your Majesty must permit me to repeat once more that it is time to rise to morning prayer, unless you choose to let it pass. The sun is just rising, and you never neglect this duty. I am mistaken, said Abu Hassan immediately. I am not asleep, but awake. For those who sleep do not hear, and I hear somebody speak to me. Then, opening his eyes again, he saw plainly by broad daylight what he had seen but indistinctly before, and starting up with a smiling countenance, like a man overjoyed at sudden promotion. The caliph, from his recess, penetrated his thoughts with great delight. The young ladies of the palace now prostrated themselves with their faces to the ground before Abu Hassan, and those who had instruments of music in their hands wished him a good morrow by a concert of soft flutes, hautboys, theorbos, and other harmonious instruments, with which he was enchanted and in such an ecstasy that he knew not whether he was himself. But reverting to his first idea, he still doubted whether what he saw and heard was a dream or reality. He clapped his hands before his eyes, and, lowering his head, said to himself, What means all this? Where am I? And to whom does this palace belong? What can these eunuchs, handsome well-dressed officers, beautiful ladies and musicians mean? How is it possible for me to distinguish whether I am in my right senses or in a dream? When he took his hands from his eyes, opened them, and lifted up his head, the sun shone full in at the chamber window, and at that instant Mesrur, the chief of the eunuchs, came in, prostrated himself before Abu Hassan, and said, Commander of the Faithful, your majesty will excuse me for representing to you that you used not to rise so late, and that the time of prayer is over. If your majesty has not had a bad night, it is time to ascend your throne and hold a council as usual. All your generals, governors, and other great officers of state wait your presence in the council hall. End of section 11《セクション12 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Story of Abu Hassan, or the Sleeper Awakened, Part 2. At this discourse, Abu Hassan was persuaded that he was neither asleep nor in a dream, but at the same time, was not less embarrassed and confused under his uncertainty what steps to take. At last, looking earnestly at Monsieur, he said to him in a serious tone, Whom is it you speak to, and call the commander of the faithful? I do not know you, and you must mistake me for somebody else. Any person but Monsieur would have been puzzled at these questions of Abu Hassan, 
but he had been so well instructed by the caliph that he played his part admirably my imperial lord and master said he your majesty only speaks thus to try me is not your majesty the commander of the faithful monarch of the world from east to west and vicar on earth to the prophet sent of god mesrour your poor slave has not forgotten you after so many years that he has had the honour and happiness to serve and pay his respects to your majesty he would think himself the most unhappy of men if he has incurred your displeasure and begs of you most humbly to remove his fears but had rather suppose that you have been disturbed by some troublesome dream abu hassan burst out laughing at these words and fell backwards upon the bolster which pleased the caliph so much that he would have laughed as loud himself if he had not been afraid of putting a stop too soon to the pleasant scene he had promised himself abu hassan when he had tired himself with laughing sat up again and speaking to a little eunuch that stood by him black as majeur said hark ye tell me who i am sir answered the little boy modestly your majesty is the commander of the believers and god's vicar on earth you are a little liar black face said abu hassan then he called the lady that stood nearest to him come hither fair one said he holding out his hand bite the end of my finger that i may feel whether i am asleep or awake the lady who knew the caliph saw all that passed was overjoyed to have an opportunity of strewing her power of diverting him went with a grave countenance and putting his finger between her teeth bit it so hard that she put him to violent pain snatching his hand quickly back again he said i find i am awake and not asleep but by what miracle am i become caliph in a night's time this is certainly the most strange and surprising event in the world then addressing himself to the same lady he said i conjure you by the protection of god in whom you trust as well as i not to hide the truth from me am i really the commander of the faithful it is so true answered the lady that we who are your slaves are amazed to find that you will not believe yourself to be so you are a deceiver replied abu hassan i know very well who i am as the chief of the eunuchs perceived that abu hassan now wished to rise he offered him his hand and helped him to get out of bed no sooner were his feet set on the floor than the chamber rang with the repeated acclamations of the officers and ladies who cried out all together commander of the faithful god give your majesty a good day oh heaven cried abu hassan what a strange thing this is last night i was abu hassan and this morning i am the commander of the believers i cannot comprehend this sudden and surprising change presently some of the officers began to dress him and when they had done mazrur led him through all the eunuchs and ladies who were ranged on both sides quite to the council chamber door which was opened by one of the officers mesrour walked before him to the foot of the throne where he stopped and putting one hand under one arm while another officer who followed did the same by the other they helped him to ascend the throne abu hassan sat down amidst the acclamations of the officers who wished him all happiness and prosperity and turning to the right and left he saw the officers of the guards ranged in order and making a fine appearance the caliph in the meantime came out of the closet and went into another which looked into the hall from whence he could see and hear all that passed in council where his grand vizier presided in his place what pleased him highly was to see abu hassan fill his throne with almost as much gravity as himself as soon as abu hassan had seated himself the grand vizier prostrated himself at the foot of the throne and rising said commander of the faithful god shower down blessings on your majesty in this life receive you into his paradise in the other world and confound your enemies 
abu hassan after all that had happened that morning that these words of the grand vizier never doubted but that he was caliph as he wished to be and without examining any farther how or by what adventure or sudden change of fortune he had become so immediately began to exercise his power and looking very gravely at the vizier asked him what he had to say commander of the faithful replied the grand vizier the emirs vizier and other officers of your council wait without till your majesty gives them leave to pay their accustomed respects abu hassan ordered the door to be opened and the grand vizier addressing himself to the officers in waiting said chief of the doorkeepers the commander of the faithful orders you to do your duty when the door was opened the viziers emirs and principal officers of the court all dressed magnificently in their habits of ceremony went in their order to the foot of the throne paid their respects to abu hassan and bowing their heads down to the carpet saluted him with the title of commander of the faithful according to the instructions of the grand vizier and afterwards took their seats when this ceremony was over and they were all placed there was a profound silence the grand vizier always standing before the throne began according to the order of papers in his hand to make his report of affairs which at that time were of very little consequence nevertheless the caliph could not but admire how abu hassan acquitted himself in his exalted station without the least hesitation or embarrassment and decided well in all matters as his own good sense suggested but before the grand vizier had finished his report abu hassan perceived the judge of the police whom he knew by sight sitting in his place stop said he to the grand vizier interrupting him i have an order of consequence to give to the judge of the police the judge of the police perceiving that abu hassan looked at him and hearing his name mentioned arose from his seat and went gravely to the foot of the throne where he prostrated himself with his face to the ground judge of the police said abu hassan go immediately to such a quarter where you will find a mosque seize the imam and four old grey beards give each of the old men a hundred bastinados and the imam four hundred after that mount them all five clothed in rags on camels with their faces to the tails and lead them through the whole city with a crier before them who shall proclaim with a loud voice this is the punishment of all those who trouble their heads with other people's affairs make it their business to create disturbances and misunderstandings in families in their neighbourhood and do them all the mischief in their power my intention is also that you enjoin them to leave that quarter and never to set foot in it more and while your lieutenant is conducting them through the town return and give me an account of the execution of my orders the judge of the police laid his hand upon his head to show his obedience and prostrating himself a second time retired to execute the mandate the caliph was highly pleased at the firmness with which this order was given and perceived that abu hassan was resolved not to lose the opportunity of punishing the imam and the other four old hypocrites of his quarter in the meantime the grand vizier went on with his report and had just finished when the judge of the police came back from executing his commission he approached the throne with the usual ceremony and said commander of the faithful i found the imam and his four companions in the mosque which your majesty pointed out and as a proof that i have punctually obeyed your commands i have brought an instrument signed by the principal inhabitants of the ward at the same time he pulled a paper out of his bosom and presented it to the pretended caliph abu hassan took the paper and reading it over cautiously with the names of the witnesses who were all people he knew said to the judge of the police smiling it is well i am satisfied return to your seat these old hypocrites said he to himself with an air of satisfaction who thought fit to censure my actions and find fault with my entertaining honest people deserved this punishment 
the caliph all the time penetrated his thoughts, and felt inconceivable delight at his frolic. Abu Hassan, then addressing himself to the Grand Vizier, said, Go to the High Treasurer for a purse of a thousand pieces of gold, and carry it to the mother of one Abu Hassan, who is known by the name of the Debauchee. She lives in the same quarter to which I sent the judge of the police. Go, and return immediately. The Grand Vizier, after laying his hand upon his head and prostrating himself before the throne, went to the High Treasurer, who gave him the money, which he ordered a slave to take, and to follow him to Abu Hassan's mother, to whom he gave it, saying only, The Caliph makes you this present. She received it with the greatest surprise imaginable. During the Grand Vizier's absence, the judge of the police made the usual report of his office, which lasted till the vizier returned. As soon as he came into the council chamber, and had assured Abu Hassan that he had executed his orders, Misrur, the chief of the eunuchs, made a sign to the viziers, the emirs, and other officers, that the council was over, and that they might all retire, which they did, by making the same prostration at the foot of the throne as when they entered. Abu Hassan descended from the caliph's throne, and Mesrur went before him to show him the way into an inner apartment, where there was a table spread. Several eunuchs ran to tell the musicians that the sham caliph was coming, when they immediately began a concert of vocal and instrumental music, with which Abu Hassan was so charmed and transported that he could not tell what to think of all he saw and heard. "'If this is a dream,' said he, "'it is a long one. But certainly,' continued he, it is no dream, for I can see and feel, walk and hear, and argue reasonably. Whatever it is, I trust in God. I cannot but believe that I am the commander of the faithful, for no other person could live in this splendour. The honour and respect that has been shown me, and the obedience paid to my commands, are sufficient proofs of my exultation. In short, Abu Hassan took it for granted that he was the commander of the faithful, but was still more convinced of it when he entered a magnificent and spacious hall, which was finely painted with the brightest colours, intermixed with gold. Seven bands of female musicians, more beautiful than the others, were placed round the hall, and as many gold chandeliers hung from the ceiling, which was painted with blue and gold, intermixed with wonderful effect. In the middle of the hall was spread a table covered with massive gold plates and dishes, which scented the apartment with the spices and amber wherewith the meat was seasoned, and seven young and most beautiful ladies, dressed in the richest habits, of the most vivid colours, stood round this table, each with a fan in her hand, to fan Abu Hassan when at dinner. If ever mortal was charmed, Abu Hassan was, when he entered this stately hall, at every step he took, he could not help stopping to contemplate at leisure all the wonders that regaled his eyes, and turned first to one side and then to the other, which gave the caliph, who viewed him with attention, very great pleasure. At last he sat down at the table, and presently all the ladies began to fan the new caliph. He looked first at one, then at another, and admired the grace with which they acquitted themselves. He told them, with a smile, that he believed one of them was enough to give him all the air he wanted, and would have six of the ladies sit at table with him, three on his right hand and three on his left, and he placed them so that, as the table was round, which way soever he turned, his eyes might be saluted with agreeable objects. The six ladies obeyed, and Abu Hassan, taking notice that out of respect they did not eat, helped them himself, and invited them to eat in the most pressing and obliging terms. Afterwards he asked their names, which they told him were Alabaster Neck, Coral Lips, Moon Face, Sunshine, Eyes Delight, Heart's Delight, and she who fanned him was Sugar Cane. The many soft things he said upon their names showed him to be a man of sprightly wit, and it is not to be conceived how much it increased the esteem which the caliph, who saw everything, had already conceived for him. 
When the ladies observed that Abu Hassan had done eating, one of them said to the eunuchs who waited, The commander of the faithful will go into the hall where the dessert is laid. Bring some water. Upon which they all rose from the table, and taking from the eunuch one a gold basin, another a ewer of the same metal, and a third a towel, kneeled before Abu Hassan, and presented them to him to wash his hands. As soon as he had done, he got up, and after a eunuch had opened the door, went, preceded by Masrur, who never left him, into another hall, as large as the former, adorned with paintings by the best masters, and furnished with gold and silver vessels, carpets, and other rich furniture. There, seven different bands of music began a concert as soon as Abu Hassan appeared. In this hall there were seven large lustres, a table in the middle covered with dried sweetmeats, the choicest and most exquisite fruits of the season, raised in pyramids, in seven gold basins, and seven ladies more beautiful than the others standing round it, each with a fan in her hand. These new objects raised still greater admiration in Abu Hassan, who, after he had made a full stop, and given the most sensible marks of surprise and astonishment, went directly to the table, where, sitting down, he gazed a considerable time at the seven ladies, with an embarrassment that plainly showed he knew not to which to give the preference. At last he ordered them all to lay aside their fans and sit down and eat with him, telling them that it was not so hot, but he could spare them that trouble. When the ladies were all placed about him, the first thing he did was to ask their names, which were different from the other seven, and expressed some perfection of mind or body, which distinguished them from one another, upon which he took an opportunity, when he presented them with fruit and so on, to say something gallant. "'Eat this fig for my sake,' said he to Chain of Hearts, who sat on his right hand, and render the fetters with which you loaded me the first moment I saw you more supportable. Then, presenting a bunch of grapes to soul's torment, Take this cluster of grapes, said he, on condition you instantly abate the torments which I suffer for your sake, and so on to the rest. By these sallies, Abu Hassan more and more amused the caliph, who was delighted with his words and actions, and pleased to think he had found in him a man who diverted him so agreeably. After Abu Hassan had tasted all the fruits in the basin, he got up and followed Masrur into a third hall, much more magnificently furnished than the other two, where he was received by the same number of musicians and ladies, who stood round a table covered with all manner of wet sweetmeats. After he had looked about him with new wonder, he advanced to the table, the music playing all the time till he sat down. The seven ladies, by his order, sat down with him, helped themselves, as he desired, to what they liked best, and he afterwards informed himself of their names, which pleased him as much as the others had done, and led him to say as many soft things to them, to the great diversion of the caliph, who lost not a word. By this time, the day beginning to close, Abu Hassan was conducted into a fourth hall, much more superb and magnificently furnished, lighted with wax in seven gold lustres, which gave a splendid light. Abu Hassan found the same number of musicians here, as he had done in the three other halls, performing in concert in the most agreeable manner, and seeming to inspire greater joy. And he saw as many ladies standing round a table covered with seven gold basins, filled with cakes, dried sweetmeats, and all such relishes as were calculated to promote drinking. There he saw, which he had not observed in any of the other halls, a sideboard, set out with seven large silver flagons, full of the choicest wines, and by them seven crystal glasses of the finest workmanship. Hitherto, in the three first halls, Abu Hassan had drunk nothing but water, according to the custom observed at Baghdad, from the highest to the lowest, and at the caliph's court, never to drink wine till the evening, all who transgressed this rule being accounted debauchees, who dared not show themselves in the daytime. 
this custom is the more laudable as it requires a clear head to apply to business in the course of the day and as no wine is drunk till evening no drunken people are seen in the streets in open day creating disturbance in the city as soon as abu hassan entered the fourth hall he went to the table sat down and was a long time in a kind of ecstasy at the sight of the seven ladies who surrounded him and were much more beautiful than any he had beheld in the other halls he was very desirous to know their names but as the music played so loud and particularly the tambour that he could not hear them speak he clapped his hands for the musicians to cease when a profound silence ensued taking by the hand the lady who stood on the right next to him he made her sit down by him and presenting her with a cake asked her name commander of the faithful said the lady i am called cluster of pearls no name replied abu hassan could have more properly expressed your worth and indeed your teeth exceed the finest pearls cluster of pearls added he since that is your name oblige me with a glass of wine from your fair hand the lady went to the sideboard and brought him a glass of wine which she presented to him with a pleasant air abu hassan took the glass with a smile and looking passionately at her said cluster of pearls i drink your health i desire you to fill out as much for yourself and pledge me she ran to the sideboard and returned with a glass in her hand but before she drank she sang a song which charmed him as much by the sweetness of her voice as by its novelty after abu hassan had drunk he made another lady sit down by him and presenting her with what she chose in the basins asked her name which she told him was morning star your bright eyes said he shine with greater lustre than that star whose name you bear do me the pleasure to bring me some wine which she did with the best grace in the world then turning to the third lady whose name was daylight he ordered her to do the same and so on to the seventh to the extreme satisfaction of the caliph when they had all filled him a glass round cluster of pearls whom he had just addressed went to the sideboard poured out a glass of wine and putting in a pinch of the same powder the caliph had used the night before presented it to abu hassan commander of the faithful said she i beg of your majesty to take this glass of wine and before you drink it do me the favour to hear a song i have composed to-day and which i flatter myself will not displease you i never sang it before with all my heart said abu hassan taking the glass and as commander of the faithful i command you to sing it for i am persuaded that so beautiful a lady cannot compose a song which does not abound with wit and pleasantry the lady took a lute and tuning it to her voice sang with so much justness grace and expression that abu hassan was in perfect ecstasy all the time and was so much delighted that he ordered her to sing it again and was as much charmed with it as at first when the lady had concluded abu hassan drank off his glass and turned his head towards her to give her those praises which he thought she merited but was prevented by the opiate which operated so suddenly that his mouth was instantly wide open and his eyes close shut and dropping his head on the cushions he slept as profoundly as the day before when the caliph had given him the powder one of the ladies stood ready to catch the glass which fell out of his hand and then the caliph who enjoyed greater satisfaction in this scene than he had promised himself and was all along a spectator of what had passed came into the hall to them overjoyed at the success of his plan he ordered abu hassan to be dressed in his own clothes and carried back to his house by the slave who had brought him charging him to lay him on a sofa in the same room without making any noise and to leave the door open when he came away the slave took abu hassan upon his shoulders carried him home by a back door of the palace placed him in his own house as he was ordered 
and returned with speed to acquaint the caliph. Well, said the caliph, Abu Hassan wished only to be caliph for one day, to punish the imam of the mosque of his quarter, and the four old men who had displeased him. I have procured him the means of doing this, and he ought to be content. In the meantime, Abu Hassan, who was laid upon his sofa by the slave, slept till very late the next morning. When the powder was worked off, he awoke, opened his eyes, and, finding himself at home, was in the utmost surprise. Cluster of pearls! Morning star! Coral lips! Moon face! cried he, calling the ladies of the palace by their names, as he remembered them. Where are you? Come hither! Abu Hassan called so loud that his mother, who was in her own apartment, heard him, and running to him upon the noise he made, said, What ails you, son? What has happened to you? At these words, Abu Hassan lifted up his head, and looking haughtily at his mother, said, Good woman, who is it you call son? Why, you, answered his mother, very mildly. Are you not Abu Hassan, my son? It is strange that you have forgotten yourself so soon. I, your son? Old bull, replied Abu Hassan. You are a liar, and know not what you say. I am not Abu Hassan, I tell you, but the commander of the faithful. Hold your tongue, son, answered the mother. One would think you are a fool to hear you talk thus. You are an old fool yourself, replied Abu Hassan. I tell you once more, I am the commander of the faithful, and God's vicar on earth. Ah, child, cried the mother, is it possible that I should hear you utter such words and show you are distracted? What evil genius possesses you to make you talk at this rate? God bless you and preserve you from the power of Satan. You are my son, Abu Hassan, and I am your mother. After she had used all the arguments she could think of to bring him to himself, and to show how great an error he was in, she said, Do not you see that the room you are now in is your own, and is not like the chamber in a palace fit for the commander of the believers, and that you have never left it since you were born, but lived quietly at home with me? Think seriously of what I say, and do not fancy things that are not, nor ever can be. Once more, my son, think seriously of it. Abu Hassan heard all these remonstrances of his mother very patiently, holding down his eyes, and clapping his hands under his chin, like a man recollecting himself, to examine the truth of what he saw and heard. At last he said to his mother, just as if he was waking out of a deep sleep, and with his hand in the same posture. I believe you are right. Methinks I am Abu Hassan. You are my mother, and I am in my own room. Then looking at her again, and at every object before him, he added, I am Abu Hassan. There is no doubt of it, and I cannot comprehend how this fancy came into my head. The mother really believed that her son was cured of the disorder of his mind, which she ascribed to a dream, began to laugh with him, and ask him questions about it, when suddenly he started up, and looking crossly at his mother, said, Old sorceress, you know not what you say. I am not your son, nor you my mother. You deceive yourself, and would deceive me. I tell you, I am commander of the faithful. And you shall never persuade me to the contrary. For heaven's sake, son, said the mother, let us leave off this discourse. Recommend yourself to God, for fear some misfortune should happen to us. Let us talk of something else. I will tell you what happened yesterday in our quarter to the imam of the mosque and the four sheikhs, our neighbours. The judge of the police came and seized them and gave each of them I know not how many strokes with a bastinado, while a crier proclaimed that such was the punishment of all those who troubled themselves about other people's business, and employed themselves in setting their neighbours at variance. 
he afterwards led them through all the streets and ordered them never to come into our quarter again abu hassan's mother little thought her son had any share in this adventure and therefore had turned the discourse on purpose to put him out of the conceit of being the commander of the faithful but instead of effacing that idea she recalled it and impressed the more deeply in his mind that it was not imaginary but real abu hassan no sooner heard this relation but he cried out i am neither thy son nor abu hassan but certainly the commander of the believers i cannot doubt after what you have told me know then that it was by my order the imam and the four sheikhs were punished and i tell you i am certainly the commander of the faithful therefore say no more of its being a dream i was not asleep but as much awake as i am now you do me much pleasure to confirm what the judge of the police told me he had executed punctually according to my order i am overjoyed that the imam and the four sheikhs those great hypocrites were so chastised and i should be glad to know how i came here god be praised for all things i am certainly commander of the faithful and all thy arguments shall not convince me of the contrary the mother who could not imagine why her son so strenuously and positively maintained himself to be caliph no longer doubted but that he had lost his senses when she found he insisted so much on a thing that was so incredible and in this thought said i pray god son to have mercy upon you pray do not talk so madly beseech god to forgive you and give you grace to talk more reasonably what would the world say to hear you rave in this manner do you not know that walls have ears these remonstrances only enraged abu hassan the more and he was so provoked at his mother that he said old woman i have desired you once already to hold your tongue if you do not i shall rise and give you cause to repent all your lifetime i am the caliph and the commander of the believers and you ought to credit me when i say so the good woman supposing that he was more distracted than ever abandoned herself to tears and beating her face and breast expressed the utmost grief and astonishment to see her son in such a state abu hassan instead of being appeased or moved by his mother's tears lost all the respect due from a son to his mother getting up hastily and laying hold of a switch he ran to his mother in great fury and in a threatening manner that would have frightened any one but a mother so partial to him said tell me directly wicked woman who i am i do not believe son replied she looking at him tenderly and without fear that you are so abandoned by god as not to know your mother who brought you into the world and to mistake yourself you are indeed my son abu hassan and are much in the wrong to arrogate to yourself the title which belongs only to our sovereign lord the caliph harun al rashid especially after the noble and generous present the monarch made us yesterday i forgot to tell you that the grand vizier jaffier came to me yesterday and putting a purse of a thousand pieces of gold into my hands bade me pray for the commander of the faithful who had sent me that present and does not this liberality concern you more than me who have but a short time to live at these words abu hassan grew quite mad the circumstance of the caliph's liberality persuaded him more than ever that he was caliph remembering that he had sent the vizier well old hag cried he will you be convinced when i tell you that i sent you those thousand pieces of gold by my grand vizier jaffier who obeyed my commands as i was commander of the faithful but instead of believing me you endeavour to distract me by your contradictions and maintain with obstinacy that i am your son but you shall not go long unpunished after these words he was so unnatural in the height of his frenzy as to beat her cruelly with his cane 
the poor mother who could not have thought that her son would have come so soon from words to blows called out for help so loudly that the neighbours ran in to her assistance abu hassan continued to beat her at every stroke asking her if he was the commander of the faithful to which she always answered tenderly that he was her son End of section 12section thirteen of the arabian nights entertainments volume three translated by jonathan scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry the story of abu hassan or the sleeper awakened part three by the time the neighbours came in abu hassan's rage began to abate the first who entered the room got between him and his mother and taking the switch out of his hand, said to him, "'What are you doing, Abu Hassan? Have you lost all fear of God and your reason? Did ever a son so well brought up as you dare to strike his mother? Are you not ashamed so to treat yours, who loves you so tenderly?' Abu Hassan, still full of fury, looked at him who spoke without returning an answer, and then, staring on all the rest of his neighbours who had followed, said, who is that Abu Hassan you speak of? Is it me you call by that name? This question disconcerted the neighbours. How, said he who spoke first, do not you know your mother, who brought you up, and with whom you have always lived? Be gone, you are impertinent vagabonds, replied Abu Hassan. I neither knew her nor you, and will not know her. I am not Abu Hassan. I am the commander of the faithful, and will make you feel it to your cost. At this speech the neighbours no longer doubted that he was mad, and to prevent his repeating his outrages, seized him, notwithstanding his resistance, and bound him hand and foot. But though apparently disabled from doing any mischief, they did not choose to leave him alone with his mother. Two of them ran for the keeper of the hospital for insane persons, who came presently with chains handcuffs, a bastinado, and many attendants. When they entered the room, Abu Hassan, who little expected such treatment, struggled to unloose himself. But after his keeper had given him two or three smart strokes upon the shoulders, he lay so quiet that the keeper and his people did what they pleased with him. As soon as they had bound and manacled him, they took him with them to the hospital. When he was got out of the house into the street, the people crowded round him. One buffeted him, another boxed him, and others called him fool and madman. To all this treatment he replied, There is no greatness and power but in God most high and almighty. I am treated as a fool, though I am in my right senses. I suffer all these injuries and indignities for the love of God. He was conducted to the hospital, where he was lodged in a grated cell. But before he was shut up, the keeper, who was hardened to such terrible execution, regaled him without pity with fifty strokes of the bastinado on his shoulders, which he repeated every day for three weeks, bidding him remember that he was not the commander of the faithful. "'I am not mad,' said Abu Hassan, "'but if I wanted your assistance, nothing would so effectually make me mad as your cruel treatment.' I want not your advice. Abu Hassan's mother went every day to visit her son, and could not forbear weeping at beholding him fall away, and sigh and complain at the hardships he endured. In short, his shoulders, back, and sides were so black and bruised that he could not turn himself. His mother would willingly have talked with him to comfort him, and to sound him whether he still retained the notion of being caliph but whenever she opened her mouth, he stopped her with so much fury that she was forced to leave him and return home, inconsolable at his obstinacy. By degrees, however, those strong and lively ideas which Abu Hassan had entertained, of having been clothed in the caliph's habit, having exercised his authority, and been punctually obeyed and treated like the true caliph, the assurance of which had persuaded him that he was so, began to wear away. 
sometimes he would say to himself, If I was the caliph and commander of the believers, how came I, when I awoke, to find myself at home, dressed in my own apparel? Why should I not have been attended by eunuchs and their chief, and a crowd of beautiful ladies? Why should the grand vizier, and all those emirs and governors of provinces, who prostrated themselves at my feet, forsake me? Undoubtedly, if I had any authority over them, they would have delivered me long ago out of the miserable condition I am in. Certainly I ought to look upon all as a dream. It is true, however, that I commanded the judge of the police to punish the imam and the four old men his companions. I ordered the grand vizier to carry my mother a thousand pieces of gold, and my commands were executed. All these points are obstacles to my believing it a dream, but there are so many things that I cannot comprehend, nor ever shall, that I will put my trust in God, who knows all things. Abu Hassan was taken up with these thoughts and reflections when his mother came to see him. She found him so much altered and emaciated that she shed a torrent of tears, in the midst of which she saluted him as she used to do, and he returned her salutation, which he had never done before since he had been in the hospital. This she looked upon to be a good sign. "'Well, my son,' said she, wiping her tears, "'how do you do, and how do you find yourself? "'Have you renounced all those whims and fancies "'which the devil had put into your head?' "'Indeed, mother,' replied Abu Hassan, "'very rationally and calmly, "'and in a tone expressive of his grief "'for the excesses he had been transported to against her. "'I acknowledge my error.' and beg of you to forgive the execrable crime which I have been guilty of towards you, and which I detest. I ask pardon also of my neighbours, whom I have abused. I have been deceived by a dream, but by so extraordinary a one, and so like the truth, that I venture to affirm any other person to whom such a thing might have happened, would have been guilty of as great or greater extravagances and i am this instant so much perplexed about it that while i am speaking i can hardly persuade myself but that what befell me was matter of fact so like was it to what happens to people who are broad awake but whatever it was i do and shall always regard it as a dream and an illusion i am convinced that i am not that shadow of a caliph and commander of the faithful but abu hassan your son the son of a person whom I always honoured till that fateful day, the remembrance of which will cover me with confusion, and whom in future I shall honour and respect all my life as I ought. At this rational declaration, the tears of sorrow and affliction which the mother of Abu Hassan had so long shed were changed into those of joy. "'My son!' cried she, transported with pleasure, my satisfaction and comfort to hear you talk so reasonably is inexpressible, and it gives me as much joy as if I had brought you into the world a second time. But I must tell you my opinion of this adventure, and observe one thing which you may not have noticed. The stranger whom you brought home the evening before your illness to sup with you went away without shutting your chamber door after him, as you desired which, I believe, gave the devil an opportunity to enter, and throw you into the horrible illusion you have been in. Therefore, my son, you ought to return God thanks for your deliverance, and beseech him to keep you from falling again into the snares of the evil spirit. "'You have found out the source of our misfortunes,' answered Abu Hassan. "'It was that very night I had the stream which turned my brain.' I bade the merchant expressly to shut the door after him, and now I find he did not do it. I am persuaded as well as you, the devil finding it open, came in, and filled my head full of these fancies. The people of Mosul, from whence this merchant came, may not know how we at Baghdad are convinced from experience that the devil is the cause of troublesome dreams when we leave our chamber doors open. But since, mother, you see I am, by the grace of God, so well recovered, for God's sake get me out of this horrible place, 
which will infallibly shorten my days if I stay here any longer. The mother, glad to hear her son was so well cured of his foolish imagination of being caliph, went immediately to the keeper, and assuring him that he was very sensible and well, he came, examined, and released him in her presence. When Abu Hassan came home, he stayed within doors some days to recover his health by better living than he had found at the hospital. But when he had recovered his strength, and felt no longer the effect of the harsh treatment he had suffered in his confinement, he began to be weary of spending his evenings alone. He accordingly entered again upon the same plan as he had before pursued, which was to provide enough every day to regale a stranger at night. The day on which Abu Hassan renewed his custom of going about sunset to the end of Baghdad Bridge, to stop the first stranger there offered, and invite him to do him the honour of supping with him, happened to be the first day of the month, that which the caliph always set apart to go in disguise out of some one of the gates, to observe what was committed contrary to the good government of the city, as established and regulated at the beginning of his reign. Abu Hassan had not been long arrived at the bridge, when, looking about him, he perceived the Mosul merchant, followed by the same slave. Persuaded that all his misfortunes were owing to the merchant's having left his door open, he shuddered at the sight of him. "'God preserve me,' said he to himself. "'If I am not deceived, there is again the magician who enchanted me.' He trembled with agitation, and looked over the side railing into the river, that he might not see him till he was past. The caliph, who wished to renew the diversion he had received, had taken care to inform himself of all that had happened to Abu Hassan, and enjoyed much pleasure at the relation given him, especially at his being sent to a madhouse. But as this monarch was both just and generous, and had taken a great liking to Abu Hassan, as capable of contributing further to his amusement, and had doubted whether, after renouncing his frenzied character of a caliph, he would return to his usual manner of living, with a view, therefore, to bring him to his palace, he disguised himself again like a merchant of Mosul, the better to execute his plan. He perceived Abu Hassan at the same time that he saw him, and presently guessed by his action that he was angry and wished to shun him. This made him walk close to the side railing, and when he came nigh him, he put his head over to look him in the face. "'Ho, oh, brother Abu Hassan!' said he, is it you? I greet you. Give me leave to embrace you. Not I, replied Abu Hassan pettishly, without looking at the pretended Mosul merchant. I do not greet you. I will have neither your greeting nor your embraces. Go along. What? answered the caliph. Do you not know me? Do you not remember the evening we spent together at your house this day month? where you did me the honour to treat me very generously? No, replied Abu Hassan in the same tone. I do not know you, nor what you talk about. Go, I say again, about your business. The caliph was not to be diverted from his purpose by this rude behaviour. He well knew the law Abu Hassan had imposed on himself, never to have commerce again with a stranger he had once entertained, but pretended to be ignorant of it. "'I cannot believe,' said he, "'but you must know me again. "'It is not possible that you should have forgotten me in so short a time. "'Certainly some misfortune has befallen you, "'which inspires you with this aversion for me. "'However, you ought to remember that I showed my gratitude by my good wishes, "'and that I offered you my interest, which is not to be slighted, "'in an affair which you had much at heart.' "'I do not know.' replied Abu Hassan, what your interest may be, and I have no desire to make use of it, but I am sensible the utmost of your good wishes ended in making me mad. In God's name, I say once more, go your way, and trouble me no more. Ah, brother Abu Hassan, replied the caliph, embracing him, I do not intend to part with you thus, since I have had the good fortune to meet with you a second time. You must exercise the same hospitality towards me again that you showed me a month ago. 
when I had the honour to drink with you. I have protested against this, said Abu Hassan, and have so much power over myself as to decline receiving a second time as my guest a man like you who carries misfortunes with him. You know the proverb, take up your drum and be gone. Make the application to yourself. How often must I repeat my refusal? God be with you. You have been the cause of my sufferings, and I will not trust myself with you again. My good friend Abu Hassan, said the caliph, embracing him, you treat me in a way I little expected. I beg of you not to speak to me thus harshly, but be persuaded of my friendship. Do me the favour to tell me what has happened to you, for I assure you I wished you well, and still do so, and would be glad of an opportunity to make you any amends for the trouble I have caused you, if it has been really my fault. Abu Hassan yielded to the solicitations of the caliph. "'Your incredulity and importunity,' said he, "'have tired my patience, and what I am going to relate will show you that I do not accuse you wrongfully.' The caliph seated himself by Abu Hassan while he told him all that had happened to him, from his waking in the palace to his waking again in his own house, all which he described as a mere dream, and recounted all the circumstances which the caliph knew as well as himself, and which renewed his pleasure. He enlarged afterwards on the impression which the dream of being caliph and commander of the faithful had made upon him, which he said threw him into such extravagancies that his neighbours were obliged to carry him to a madhouse, where he was treated in a manner which he deemed most barbarous and inhuman. But, said he, what will surprise you, and what you little think of, is that it was altogether your fault that these things happened to me. For if you remember, I desired you to shut the door after you, which you neglected, and the devil, finding it open, entered, and put this dream into my head, which, though it was very agreeable, was the cause of the misfortune I complain of. You, therefore, for your negligence, are answerable for the horrid and detestable crime I have committed in lifting my hand against my mother, whom I might have killed. I blush for shame when I think of it, because she said I was her son, and would not acknowledge me for commander of the faithful, as I thought, and positively insisted on to her, that I was. You are the cause of the offence I have given my neighbours, when, running in at the cries of my poor mother, they surprised me in the horrid act of felling her at my feet, which would never have happened if you had taken care to shut my door when you went away, as I desired you. They would not have come into my house without my leave, and, what troubles me most of all, they would not have been witnesses of my folly. I should not have been obliged to strike them in my own defence, and they would not have bound and fettered me to carry and shut me up in the hospital for madmen, where I assure you every day that I remained confined in that hell, I received a score of strokes with a bastinado. Abu Hassan recounted his complaints with great warmth and vehemence to the caliph, who knew as well as himself what had passed and was delighted to find that he had succeeded so well in his plan to throw him into the vagaries, from which he still was not entirely free. He could not help laughing at the simplicity wherewith he related them. Abu Hassan, who thought that his story should rather have moved compassion, and that every one ought to be as much concerned at it as himself, warmly resented the pretended Mosul merchant's laughter. What? said he. Do you make a jest of me, and laugh in my face? Or do you believe I laugh at you when I speak seriously? If you want proof of what I advance, look yourself, and see whether or no I tell the truth. With that, stooping down and baring his shoulders, he showed the caliph the scars and wheels which the bastinado had left. The caliph could not behold these marks of cruelty without horror. He pitied Abu Hassan and felt sorry he had carried the jest so far. "'Come, rise, dear brother,' said he to him eagerly, and embracing Abu Hassan heartily in his arms. "'Let me go to your house, and enjoy the happiness of being merry with you to-night, and to-morrow, if it please God, 
all things will go well. Abu Hassan, notwithstanding his resolution never to admit the same stranger a second time, could not resist the caresses of the caliph, whom he still took for a merchant of Mosul. "'I will consent,' said he, "'if you will swear to shut my door after you, that the devil may not come in to distract my brain again.' The caliph promised that he would, upon which they both arose, walked towards the city, and, followed by the caliph's slave, reached Abu Hassan's house by the time it was dark. The caliph, the more to blind Abu Hassan, said to him, "'Place confidence in me. I promise you, on my honour, I will not break my word. You need not hesitate to trust a person who wishes you all happiness and prosperity, of which confidence you will see the effects.' "'I desire not that,' said Abu Hassan, stopping him short. "'I yield to your importunity, but I dispense with your good wishes, and beg you in God's name to form none for me. All the mischief that has hitherto befallen me arose from those you expressed for me, and from your leaving the door open.' "'Well,' replied the caliph, still laughing at the misguided imagination of Abu Hassan, "'since you will have it so,' I promise you I will form none. You give me pleasure by speaking so, said Abu Hassan. I desire no more. I shall be more than satisfied, provided you keep your word, and I shall forgive you all the rest. As soon as Abu Hassan entered his house, he called for his mother and for candles, desired his guest to sit down upon a sofa, and then placed himself by him. A little time after, supper was brought up and they both began to eat without ceremony. When they had done, Abu Hassan's mother cleared the table, set on a small dessert of fruit, wine, and glasses by her son, then withdrew and appeared no more. Abu Hassan first filled out his own glass, and then the caliph's, and after they had drunk some time, and talked of indifferent matters, the caliph, perceiving that his host grew warm with liquor, began to talk of love, and asked him if he had ever felt that passion. Brother, replied Abu Hassan, familiarly thinking his guest was his equal, I never looked upon love or marriage but as a slavery, to which I was always unwilling to submit, and must own to you that I never loved anything but good cheer and good wine. In short, to divert and entertain myself agreeably with my friends." Yet I do not tell you that I am indifferent to marriage, or incapable of attachment. If I could meet with a woman of such beauty and sweetness of temper as her I saw in my dream, that fatal night, in which I first received you into my house, and you to my misfortune left my door open, who would pass the whole night with me drinking, singing, and playing on some instrument, and in agreeable conversation, and who would study to please and divert me, I believe, on the contrary, I should change all my indifference into a perfect attachment to such a person, and, I think, should live very happily with her. But where is such a woman to be found, except in the caliph's palace, or in those of the grand vizier, or some great lords of the court, who want not money to provide them? I choose, therefore, to stick to my bottle, which is a much cheaper pleasure in which I can enjoy as well as the greatest. Saying these words, he filled out his own and the caliph's glass, and said, Come, take your glass, and let us pursue this charming pleasure. When they had drunk off their wine, It is a great pity, said the caliph, that so gallant a man as you, who owns himself not insensible of love, should lead so solitary a life. I prefer the easy, quiet life I live, replied Abu Hassan, before the company of a wife whose beauty might not please me, and who, besides, might create me a great deal of trouble by her imperfections and ill-humour. The conversation lasted a long time, and the caliph, seeing Abu Hassan had drunk to the pitch he desired, said, Let me alone. Since you have the same good taste as every other honest man, I warrant you I will find you a wife that shall please you. Then, taking Abu Hassan's glass, and putting a pinch of the same powder into it, filled him up a bumper, and, presenting it to him, said, 
Come, let us drink beforehand the fair lady's health, who is to make you happy. I am sure you will like her. Abu Hassan took the glass laughing, and shaking his head said, Be it so. Since you desire it, I cannot be guilty of so great a piece of incivility, nor disoblige a guest of so much merit in such a trifling matter. I will drink the health of the lady you promise me, though I am very well contented as I am, and do not rely on your keeping your word. No sooner had Abu Hassan drunk off his bumper than he was seized with as deep a sleep as before, and the caliph ordered the same slave to take him and carry him to the palace. The slave obeyed, and the caliph, who did not intend to send back Abu Hassan as before, shut the door after him, as he had promised, and followed. End of section 13